when discussing Shakespeare, many tend to classify him mainly as an Elizabethan playwright. And while a majority of his plays were written when Elizabeth I was on the throne, the latter part of Shakespeare's career was as a Jacobean playwright. In fact, what we classify as his great tragedies, Othello, King Lear, Antony and Cleopatra, Coriolanus, and the Scottish play Macbeth were all written during the Jacobean era. Elizabeth I's death on March 24, 1603, brought about the end of the Tudor dynasty, and her lack of an heir brought about a big question. Who was going to take the throne? Well, that place would be taken by James VI of Scotland, son of Mary, Queen of Scots, and Elizabeth's closest blood relative. So, James VI of Scotland moved to England and became James I. James was a noted arts patron, with theater in particular flourishing at court. And famously, James became the royal patron for the acting troupe to which Shakespeare was a part of, officially changing their name from the Lord Chamberlain's men to the King's men. And the troupe would frequently perform for the King at Whitehall. Because many of Shakespeare's plays were performed in front of monarchs, theatrical flattery abounds, particularly in the history plays. If he wrote something the Queen or King didn't like, that could very well be his last play. With this in mind, one could reasonably assume that pleasing the monarch for which the troupe performed would have been a key factor in Shakespeare's and other playwrights' works. Looking at the Jacobean plays, a strong contender following this school of thought is Macbeth, a Scottish play for a Scottish king. Written in 1606, Macbeth carves a dark tale of regicide and witchcraft. And you know who happened to have an obsession with witches? Good old King James. Before assuming the English throne in 1603, James was a key player in the horrifying Scottish witch trials of the 16th century, in particular, the North Berwick witch trials of 1590 to 91. In fact, James was so fascinated by witchcraft, he published his own views on how to seek out and punish witches who threatened the security of the monarchy in his book, Demonology. That's right, the same guy who commissioned the King James Bible also wrote a book called Demonology, a book which many believe supplied Shakespeare with quite a bit of supernatural inspiration. But enough about James, let's talk about our other Scottish king, Macbeth. At the beginning of the play, Macbeth and his friend Banquo are returning from a successful battle when they encounter three witches, or the Weird Sisters, on the heath and receive a prophecy. For Macbeth, he shall become king of Scotland. For Banquo, while he may not become king himself, he shall produce a line of kings. Now Macbeth hears this and almost shrugs it off. How can he possibly become king? King Duncan is alive and well, and he has two sons of his own who would obviously ascend the throne. Regardless, Macbeth shares this news with his wife, Lady Macbeth, and she wastes no time in hatching a plan to kill Duncan to assure she and Macbeth become king and queen of Scotland. From the moment he hears the witch's prophecy to the moment he ultimately kills Duncan, Macbeth is constantly questioning Unlike Lady Macbeth, who is staunch and sure in her convictions, Macbeth is plagued with inner turmoil. It is precisely this characteristic that makes Macbeth unique from Shakespeare's other great villains like Iago, Edmund, and Richard III. They are all able to conquer their guilt and self-doubt. Macbeth has a conscience. However, Macbeth is ultimately persuaded and murders King Duncan while he's asleep pinning the murder on two of Duncan's servants. The Macbeths put on a great show for everyone, pretending to be horrifically shocked by the death, and Duncan's two sons, Malcolm and Donald Bain, fearing for their own lives, decide to flee Scotland, which works out well for the Macbeths because everyone then believes the sons had something to do with Duncan's death, and the path is clear for the Macbeths to take the throne. And no one is the wiser, except for Macbeth's old pal Banquo, who grows suspicious of Macbeth and how quickly the witch's prophecy came to be. 
This monologue from Act Three, Scene One, finds Macbeth newly crowned King of Scotland. Yet, he believes his crown is in jeopardy already. The threat? Banquo. Remember the part about Banquo in the Weird Sister's prophecy. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. Fearing Banquo will overthrow him, Macbeth's mistrust of his former friend causes him to think about the fact that he will have no successors of his own, which creates major anxiety. Because what good is a king if he has no one to continue the family line? Macbeth's speech, and actually the whole play itself, is filled with nature imagery and language. Fruitless crown, the seed of Banquo's kings, highlighting this idea of lineage and how nothing of the sort will grow from Macbeth. He and his line are barren. Now comparing this monologue to two of his previous ones found in Act 1, Scene 7, If it were done, when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly, and Act 2, Scene 1, Is this a dagger which I see before me? We see a turning point in Macbeth's character. While he is contemplating murder in all three, what drives his deliberation this time is not guilt and shame, but instead panic and rage. Gone are his moments of reflection and regret. Macbeth has officially replaced Lady Macbeth as the villain of the play. As soon as he murdered Duncan, Macbeth relinquished his soul. He even said he was unable to say amen after the act, yet right after this monologue, he is able to converse with assassins at ease. And even after the murder of Banquo, he shows no remorse. At this point in the play, Macbeth is a mere shell of a man with one thought on his mind, ensuring his place on the throne no matter what. Oh, in fact, Macbeth goes so far as to challenge fate itself, since it is no longer in his favor. And that's kind of the whole deal with the Macbeths, isn't it? They're not going to wait for fate to play out. They're going to make things happen. Now what saves Macbeth from being a one-dimensional bad guy, however, is how poignantly aware he is of his evil choices, as well as his deteriorating humanity, which he visits in his pivotal soliloquy in Act 5, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Now, by the end of this soliloquy, Macbeth has decided he needs to kill Banquo to prevent the second part of the witch's prophecy from coming true. We witness Macbeth's moral decline and see how power corrupts. Macbeth is a beautifully complicated tragic figure. We share in his pain and turmoil early on in the play. We rebuke his selfish and idiotic choices, and we both celebrate and mourn his demise. Oh, and remember that part about Banquo's familial line producing kings? Well, it was believed that a certain King James was a part of that line. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep, and in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. Tis much he dares, and to that dauntless temper of his mind he hath a wisdom that doth guide his valor to act in safety. There is none but he whose being I do fear, and under him my genius is rebuked, as it is said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters when first they put the name of king upon me, and bade them speak to him. Then, 
prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings, and upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my grip, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand. No son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind, for them, the gracious Duncan, have I murdered, <sighs> put rancors in the vessel of my peace, only for them, and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the sons of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate into the list and champion me to the utterance. <laughs>